I'm Heidi Hetner, and today on Coffee with H Times 2, I'm honored to welcome Ellen Weininger. She's the Outreach Director for Grassroots Environmental Education and also the co-founder of SAPE, which is the Stop the Algonquin Pipeline Organization. We'll be talking about both organizations, her work. This is all based in New York State, but it spans beyond the state. She does a variety of environmental issues. She covers them, helps, does activism, teaches, and does a lot, a lot of out outreach. So I want to welcome Ellen. So great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me here today, Heidi. It's a, a real honor. Thank you. So, so tell us about grassroots environmental education and what you all do. Uh, well, in a nutshell, Grassroots is a science-based environmental health organization. And um, we work directly with medical experts and scientists uh, from around the country and actually internationally on a variety of issues and our goal is to educate the public around the common environmental exposures that we experience every day and the links to human health and environmental impacts. So uh, we work with science-based material and uh, create advocacy tools and hold forums and serve local and state governments and school systems and other environmental and health organizations around the country. That's excellent. So tell us about some of the specific things that you, you're covering, the areas. So I know you have, you know, you just, you cover environmental toxins, energy, recycling, land management, you have the, the Green Towns program. So tell us a little bit about those. Uh, well, we have a lot of uh, uh, programs, uh, many signature programs like the Child Safe School, uh, the U the ubiquitous exposures, uh, ex environmental exposures in a school setting and how they impact children and provides uh, solutions and policy solutions and um, uh, the background material as to why we should be looking at these issues. That's just one area. In local communities, a program like How Green Is My Town right. provides uh, the answers to many of the questions that need to be raised in towns as to how they can go about uh, creating a green town and addressing land issues, transportation, uh, procurement, and even providing a comprehensive environmental plan, policy solutions. So it's not about spending money, it's about becoming aware of these issues and then uh, accessing the piece of the puzzle that maybe someone in California, a municipality in California, has solved. Right. Um, so that's another example. Um, so I know you have, for instance, you worked on the no idling, the no bus idling at schools. Can you explain why that's important? I mean, we can't assume everyone everyone understands how dangerous those those toxins are for children at, in, at those sites. And right. those buses run and run and run. Any parent knows. Yes. They sit out in front of schools, and little kids are getting off the bus and getting on the bus and breathing this very polluted air. So. So you all help to stop that in New York State. Well, uh, it's a really important issue, and it's a simple one to solve, because all you need to do is shut off the engine. So whether it's a motor vehicle, whether you're sitting in your own car, or whether it's a school bus, um, it's easy to address. Uh, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to enforce. Mm -hmm. Who is responsible? So New York State Department of Education passed, uh, well, has a, a law on the state books uh, to ban uh, bus idling and motor vehicle idling at school on school property. But who enforces that? Right. There are no agencies like uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, a counterpart in the school setting to protect children. So we still need to work on that. Parents it's, need to learn about it. Bus drivers need to learn about it. I'm, I'm amazed that within the bus companies themselves, they're not, the bus drivers aren't taught turn the bu turn the motor off. Well, there's, there are a lot of misconceptions about the, uh, shutting off the engine, especially when you get into uh, situations where you have cold weather. The idea is keep the bus idling. Maybe that keeps the bus warm, but, uh, and that that's beneficial to the bus, mm -hmm. when in fact, we've learned directly from bus manufacturers that that's not the case, and that it's actually not a good idea to keep the bus idling um, as it's standing and waiting for uh, students. And of course, the students are coming out dressed and bundled, wearing hats and gloves right. and They're too hot scarves, when they get in the and bus. They don't need to have a right. bus that's all heated up. In fact, it takes, you could sit on a bus for half an hour uh, before it really starts to mm. get uh, that chill. And of course, in warmer weather, it, it makes the air hotter. 
right? So right. it contributes to the heat all around the school, so the kids get super hot when they get on the bus. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because there's more and more studies showing that polluted air affects IQ, causes brain damage, affects dementia, right? All these, th all these neurological issues. So this is a big one, and it's amazing how people don't know. Air pollution is actually, according to the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. one of the uh, largest issues in terms of public health. In fact, accounts for over 7 million premature deaths worldwide. So there is no safe level of diesel exhaust exposure, mm. according to the EPA. So it's simple, shut off the engine. Um, and uh, no one should be exposed to it. it. There is no safe level. And those cabins fill up pretty quickly. Those bus cabins fill up pretty quickly with diesel exhaust when those buses are idling. And that's why it's so dangerous for children. One of the, a recent article I read said if it smells bad, that's a really good signal that the air is not healthy for you. Uh, that's a good signal. Right. Yes. So <laughs> diesel air is pretty stinky. Yes. And you, it's shocking to me that schools, I know as a parent waiting on those lines, all those cars. So to move on, I know there's a lot of other things you all have done. You've worked on fracking. You've worked on getting pesticides out of schools, right? Getting them yes. off, off of the school property, um, using non-toxic products in the schools. So you have an amazing site. And I recommend to all of our viewers that they go to grassroots environmental education to get a list of products, safe products, and a list of all of these sort of issues which are pertinent for, for everyone, right? Exactly. For parents, for, for, for cities, for towns, even things like asphalt. Um, you've right. worked on an asphalt that's permeable? A permeable paving, which is a great um, option when a town is um, uh, looking at work, perhaps not just on town property, but also commercial property. Mm. It's very easy to, um, to mandate something that, like that in a, a shopping center. Um, and, and have that as a requirement. It doesn't cost the municipality anything, mm -hmm. but makes a huge difference in, ter in terms of stormwater runoff. When okay. you have full absorption of, uh, of that stormwater rather than constant runoff, which is creating all kinds of problems. So that seems like a really important one for climate change when we have this major, major weather patterns with lots of water and overflow. Exactly, exactly. And it's simple simple enough. One of the programs, as we mentioned earlier, How Green Is My Town, mm. has lots of those kinds of uh, simple, simple policy solutions that make a huge difference. And cost effective, too. Cost effective. Interesting on the asphalt. Uh, one of my last guests was Dr. John Warner, a green chemist, and he's just created an asphalt that um, can be com a material that can be combined with an older asphalt and it can be reused so that you eliminate these sites of, 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 of waste full of old asphalt, which is toxic. Right. And this way, they just reuse it. So you might be interested in your. Yeah, your, that sounds your, like you an interesting. Look into it. Yeah, and he's just invented this. So right. he's got an amazing series of inventions. I know that would appeal to you, from yeah. hair color to hair straightener to asphalt to cancer drugs. Right. He's hit a long list of things. So I want to move on to fracking. I know that you all were very, very involved with the uh, stopping of fracking in New York State, which was which was major because I, I believe New York State is the only state in the United States that has completely banned fracking. Is that true? Well, actually, Vermont. Uh, has a ban, complete, uh, a complete ban, a ban on uh, fracking um, in the state of Vermont. Although there they really the isn't much in the way of shale right. in Vermont, the it was never a real right there, so it's not an threat. Issue. It yeah. was not a threat, right. it, but um, but New York um, it was a very very big landmark uh, decision by the governor and by the New York State um, by New York State to do that. But um, it didn't solve. Um, all the problems. So what's happening now? Well, um, that ban, actually, what it did was it banned the, um, the extraction and drilling and production of high volume hydraulic fracturing, which means any kind of uh, extraction activities and drilling activities that involve over 300,000 gallons of water. Right. But it doesn't impact the continuation of extraction and drilling when low volume wells are drilled and when vertical wells are drilled. And actually in New York State, we have over 12,000 active uh, oil and gas wells that are either vertical or low volume uh, hydraulic fracturing Interesting. wells. And so that's one piece of it. And it is those wells are producing enormous quantities of fracking waste. 
um, and it's the waste that emerges from the extraction and production process. And what's in that waste? Uh, uh, a real toxic brew of chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals, neurotoxins. We don't know what all of those chemicals are because um, the uh, industry is not required to report. The secret, the secret brew. The secret brew, but we do know that there are um, uh, thousands of different kinds of uh, toxic chemicals in the drilling fluids that go in and then all of the um, various uh, toxins that are emerging as part of the drilling waste which also pull up heavy metals uh, from geological formations and radioactivity. There's a lot of radium 226 and 228 uh, that is well known to be present in the Marcellus Shale for example which underlies New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio. And some of that's and airborne. It travels long distances. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that right. is correct. So that, that affects correct. children's bodies, and pregnant affects, women? It affects everyone. It affects everyone because it becomes airborne. It can be inhaled. Um, it can be ingested. becomes part of the food chain, part of our water supply, part of our crops uh, that we're trying to raise, even uh, organic crops. So. There are very important points for people to understand that what happens with that waste, how is it disposed of, and there really are no uh, regulations because it is not classified as hazardous waste even though it meets criteria for hazardous waste. So New York State has very little oversight over its transport, over its disposal. Um, what about the counties that have banned it? Well, interestingly enough, uh, as we became more and more aware of the radioactivity issue and the toxins issue and how this waste is allowed to be used. Uh, as a de-icer on the road? As a de-icer on the road. It means it just disperse into, into soil, waterways, the, water it, supply? It's allowed to be used by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation as a de-icer. It's allowed to be used for dust control, for road dust maintenance. Dust control? And road maintenance. And it, can, it doesn't necessarily have to be the fracking waste that literally comes directly off the uh, hauler's truck. It can even be something that is processed and turned into and dewatered into salts and become so we wouldn't road know. salts. So you wouldn't necessarily know. So a salting know. company wouldn't even know where that came from and what that was exactly. Or do, or do they know? Do they have to know? They, there's no requirement. You don't necessarily know point of origin of a product. You purchase off of a New York State procurement uh, list if you're a municipality. There's no disclosure as to where this is coming from and what, what the constituents are. You could just say road salt, sodium chloride, but it doesn't necessarily have more information, and that's the problem. That's outrageous. And so there's also the issue of these new pipelines. I know that's the, the FERC, which is a federal regulation organization from D.C., has authorized these pipelines carrying up fracking gas from fracked gas from Pennsylvania yes. to go all the way through up through New England mm -hmm. and there's multiple multiple pipelines and there are a lot of concerns from many many different groups yes. about the dangers of these pipelines can you tell us about yes. that so this is a big issue another big issue New York State uh, bans fracking and can, uh, because of the health review that was conducted uh, looking at the scientific literature and that literature talks about the health impacts of some of these infrastructure components from pipelines and from compressor stations that are part of these pipeline structures but yet New York State stopped short and just focused on that extraction and production mm -hmm. part but did not look at the whole life cycle the transportation system, getting the product from Pennsylvania to a point of destination, how does it get there? And what happens in the process? What are what do these pipeline systems uh, do? And what impact do they have on the communities, not only right the frontline communities, but all of us as a whole? Um, how how does it impact our pollution again? water contamination, uh, crop contamination, and, and explosions, climate change. And, 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 explosions well, and climate change. Climate change. 
So all of these issues are hot button issues and are integral to the whole story about pipeline infrastructure, which is uh, proliferating across New York State, but across the eastern seaboard and around the country. So one of, one of the people I, I speak to is Antonia Juhaj, and she was at COP21 in Paris where they had this new climate change agreement with leaders from around the world. And they all just recently signed this, uh, an Earth Day 2016. They made, they, the world leaders agreed, we are going to you know, have this, we're going to target lowering emissions, we're going to, but so are they talking about fracking? Is that part of the discussion? Interestingly, uh, not really, first of all. Or we gas know, use. And we, we know that, we know that the, the agreement, unfortunately, just didn't go far enough. And that, that's one whole other separate issue that was very disappointing. Yes, it's great to get uh, all those countries in a room and agree on something, but they didn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the issue around the uh, extraction and production of gas, so-called natural gas, uh, as it's as it's right. known, which is a misnomer. It's really a marketing tool because it's really methane gas, and methane gas we know is 86 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, and yet it's still promoted as a clean energy. Can you say that percentage one more time, and then we're going to have to end because that's just such a shocking number. 83 percent, according according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Methane gas, which is a greenhouse gas, is far more potent than carbon dioxide, and it is 86 times 86 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide over a 20-year period. Over a 100-year time frame, as the methane dissipates, it's 35 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. But we don't have 100 years. To well, we don't want take that action either, on climate though. change, right, we right. don't have that. Right. We have to act immediately on, on climate change. We have to take really bold action, and people need to be fully engaged and involved, no matter where they're coming from. Right. And we keep discovering all these methane leaks around the U.S. We're awash in methane, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have to end. You are full of incredible information. For anyone who would like to know more, please go to Grassroots Environmental Education. Our guest is Ellen Weininger. She is just endowed with information about all of these issues, and the site is extraordinary. You, you want solutions, they're there. You want to know what to buy, what's safe, what's non-toxic. You want to know how to get involved with any of these topics, which, and they're all really, really relevant and, and important for our children today. I recommend you go to the Hearst site. So thank you so much, Ellen. It's been great having you on. Hope to have you back. Thank you. And good luck with your work. And just two words about what people can do who would like to be more active in, in any way. I know that you all do a lot of work with policy. So do you suggest that people actually contact their politicians and speak up? Yes. Um, everyone can be involved. Everyone must be involved. Um, because these are issues that affect everyone, whether it's in your own home, whether it's in your school system, or whether it's in your community. It's not just worldwide you know, on the larger level. And we all have an important voice and we can all affect change. So I strongly urge people to um, speak up to their representatives on the local level, on the state level, and on the federal level. And they do listen. And I, they do listen. They do listen. I've seen that with your work. You have affected great change. And it's all citizen act activism. It's all citizen activism. Backed by science. Back by you all science. do terrific research. All Yale, based, University, MIT, all, yes, Harvard, all yes, the top scientists. Yes. And we have all of those tools available, all of those communication tools that are uh, supportive documents that are science-based. Excellent. All of it. Well, thank you so much, and keep up the good work. Thank you. This is Heidi Hutner on Coffee with H Times 2. I'm so excited to have had Ellen on our show and look forward to more. You can go to my website, HeidiHutner.com, and see more of our interviews. Thanks. Mm -hmm.